like I promised, we're going to talk about Tulsi Gabbard. Here we are. We're talking about Tulsi Gabbard. Now, look, just to kind of give you guys an idea of what's happening. Um, first, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, when she first entered into the race, was constantly being attacked by CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Vanity Fair, The Hill, Washington Post. I can go on and on and on where they're just making all these negative articles about her. And that's what really upset us here at Harlan's Media because you're not really telling us who this candidate is. You're just attacking her. And it also, let's face it, the DNC really doesn't like her because she stood up and called out corruption. And what did the DNC do? They just decided to just turn away from her. And um, already she's gaining traction. You know, she, she's already secured herself on two debate stages, but there's still a media blackout. But that was all until at least yesterday when Glenn Greenwald, one of the co-founders of The Intercept, actually did a sit-down interview with Representative Tulsi Gabbard. And I say it's about time because I'm just tired of seeing the same old articles about Tulsi Gabbard. And they're nothing but negative hit pieces. So finally, The Intercept did a professional interview uh, with Tulsi Gabbard. I know we, we've covered a couple other interviews in the past uh, with Nico Howes and um, uh, Jimmy Dore. And hopefully us and, one and day. Kim Iverson. Yeah, hopefully us too. We would like to definitely interview Representative Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, but I would say that, uh, you know, with this interview, it was more in regards for her policy and foreign policy decisions and where she stands on American interventionism and really how we get out of these endless wars that we're in. That's one of her key talking points uh, for her campaign. And, it's, and I think right now, as it currently stands, she's the only one with a really strong progressive uh you know, uh, policy towards you know foreign she's the intervention. Only one yeah, making a point. Like yeah, she's, yeah, she's, yeah. He, like she's even to the left of Bernie Sanders, which is why we've always said on this show that you know she needs to be on not only just those two debate stages, but other debate stages, so that she can influence Bernie she, Sanders. She needs to do to, yeah. to the electorate what Bernie Sanders did to domestic policy in 2016. Yeah. She needs people to find if her campaign ends and she doesn't get the nomination, but she gets Americans to go, yeah, why are we? putting military bases everywhere and have all these wars, that will mean so much for so many millions of people on this planet. Yeah, and, and there's another thing too to take away because I really liked how she, because let's face it, the DNC and at least corporate media has been trying to portray Tulsi Gabbard as someone who doesn't understand the war on terror, but she made it very clear that there, look, there are these terrorist organizations where they're run by you know extreme religious maniacs and they're using Wahhabism, which mm -hmm. is something that's stirred up in Saudi Arabia, which is apparently is the United States' closest ally. We and love they, them, and they so have and they and they have a nuclear facility in their country now, all thanks to the Trump administration. So it's it's it, it, it's interesting that you know you, you have her actually defend her policies and really say like yes, we have to do something about terrorism. It, it's 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 something that's going to be around. And and even if we change our policies like that overnight, there are going to be still those that want to commit acts of terror and hurt innocent civilians. I mean, it's it's just the long-lasting scar of the war on terror, but also previous interventionist wars that the United States has done, which has made a bad image for the United States and the American people. So we need somebody who's actually going to call it out and bring and change. And will change happen overnight? Not really. But you know, we do need to have someone who is able to address why we got to get out of these foreign wars, but also uh, address the fact that, look, there are terrorist organizations and we will be in this continuous war, but we do need to wind down from it. But what I also liked about the interview with her and Glenn Greenwald is that she talked about why we should not interfere, intervene in Venezuela and not continue a war with Iran or start a war with Iran because, again, it's going to take away more uh, treasury from the United States. It's going to kill more innocent civilians, and it's going to be a disservice to our men and women in uniform. And that's something that we shouldn't be allowed, especially as we are trying to build a better future and as we're trying to really <laughs> address some issues that don't require a hammer every time we see somebody or a country just not fall in line with the American point of view. Paul, Daniel, I want to get your thoughts on this. Paul, I know yeah. you, you saw the interview as well. Yeah, the interview was great. It's, um, I don't even think I'm going out on a limb to say that this so far has been the best interview of Tulsi Gabbard since she announced her candidacy for the 2020 primary. Yeah. Um, fantastic interview. Glenn Greenwald is a fantastic interviewer and asked wonderful questions. So in contrast to questions she received from mainstream media outlets and others, it wasn't a hammering on, oh, how come you're a, an apologist for Assad? How come, uh, basically in the framing of the question, intentionally smearing her, uh, Greenwald instead get, phrases questions in a way that says, okay, we understand what you've said in the past about this. We're seeking clarification about your stance on, on this particular issue. 
Um, some of the questions I thought were really interesting and, and shed the most light and some of the lingering questions that I had for Tulsi uh, were things about accusations that she was uh, sympathized with uh, uh, Indian nationalistic groups, particularly uh, Modi, the uh, president of, of India. Um, and she talked about, yes, she did indeed go and, and speak with Modi and was able to reiterate that it is important to engage with other leaders in, in the world. It's important to have an open dialogue whether or not you uh, agree with their policies or agree with their positions. And she also mentioned that she sat down with opposition leaders in India uh, and called out a lot of, uh, of the atrocities and a lot of the really terrible things that Modi and his party encourage and do in India. And so I think that's that's one of the points that doesn't often get talked about, but it was one of those, for me, lingering questions of where she stands as being an Indian American, as having a father who uh, is aligned with a lot of these nationalistic groups. Where does she stand? How does she dissent from uh, the her parents' perspective and how how what is her personal perspective on, on these things? With regard to her stances on foreign wars and foreign interventionism, she has been principled and continues to reiterate those points extremely strongly and, and has maybe the best position of anyone. We're talking about the, the, how great it is to be able to get her on the debate stage. As someone who uh, is a current major in the U.S. National Guard, she has more standing and more authority to speak on those issues than anyone else mm -hmm. on the debate stage. Now, there is some concern. Uh, I've heard this uh, rumblings of the fact that the DNC may retroactively change their rules about how many individual contributors you need to get on the debate stage. Unsurprisingly. From 65,000 up to 100,000. They'll yeah. probably change that in the second debate or the second yeah. round. Second round of debates. Right. Yeah, so probably do that. It, if you, like us, want to, at the very least, make sure that we see Tulsi on these debate stages so that the conversation can uh, these conversations about America's foreign policy and our actions in, in, on the greater world stage can be put front and center. It behooves all of us to throw a dollar or two to her campaign so that we make sure that she has enough individual contributors to stay on the debate stage at the very least. Yeah, so yeah, very quickly, imagine a situation where we're watching a debate on TV that doesn't have, on domestic policy, that doesn't have Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Tulsi. That's, I mean, it's a very different debate. It means yeah. very different. What people will get out of it will be very different. This is what Tulsi represents in foreign policy. I want to see more people like Tulsi in these debates, but right now we have Tulsi, so let's let her be heard by people. You know, I, I will say this about Tulsi Gabbard. Like, the, the media blackout on her is on purpose because, you know, it, I've, I've watched a few videos from Jimmy Dore uh, where, like, they were talking about, like, uh, how she's just getting a blackout. She's not being mentioned in any of the polling data from The Hill or Washington Post or New York Times. She's not being put in there because you want to know why? Establishment media has ties to the military-industrial complex. It has ties to the corporations, Wall Street, and big banks who donate to the Democratic and Republican establishment because as soon as there's somebody talking about peace, it's a threat to their lifestyle it's a threat to the system it's a threat to what how american policies run and the thing is we as the american people as voters have every right to really question well why are we getting involved in venezuela why are we getting involved in their in their government situation this is something that the venezuelan people need to solve themselves why are we at war with iran why are we still in afghanistan and in iraq why are why did we destabilize libya which is now basically has slavery in its country now why are we getting involved? Why are we wasting treasury? We, our U.S. forces should be used as a sign of humanitarian relief, but also, hey, here are the good guys. Not, oh, no, is our country going to be overthrown? We, Paul. We don't, I don't yeah, go Paul goes, we don't want to have America, uh, kids in the Middle East. When kids in the Middle East think of America, we don't want them to say, I'm terrified of blue skies because that's when the American drones come by. We want them to think, oh, Americans are coming. They're, they're going to make it better. That's If we don't have that response from people... What are we doing besides yeah. making money? Uh, I just also want to point out, um, whenever Tulsi is interviewed, whenever she speaks, she has an amazing demeanor. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing to watch how people want to try and get a rise out of her. People want to, to see her make a gaffe, to, to step out of line, to, to do something that, even if she's saying something that's completely accurate and completely defensible, they can say, oh, but look, she's getting angry. Yeah. Wag their finger at her. And she 
maintains her composure extremely well and is unbelievably articulate on these on these matters and and i think she deserves right. as much support and as she before can. we go before you go into that i think the only person i know in modern politics right now that has that kind of a hold on themselves is actually i would say an aoc yeah you've seen her under pressure she does not crack at all no. it's not it, even well, well representative tulsi gabbard has been you know grilled by establishment media so much uh, but she's she's able to hold her ground, and I'm really impressed with her composure. And not only should she be on the on the first two debates, but on the third, fourth, fifth, and going all the way into the primary. Look, I want her there because I see her as a potential ally for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and maybe together they can work to build a better future. But I want to give a shout out to Hank Kershaw, man, you are honorary captain. You mentioned Joe Rogan of the Joe Rogan Podcast Show, one of my favorite shows to watch too. The guy's brilliant. It's an that, experience. Uh, oh, Joe Rogan experience. <laughs> there we go. Experience. I screwed that up, man. It's I am, all the I, difference. I am not. On point today, and then Ron Paul both endorsed Tulsi this week, and you know I find those endorsements very interesting because you know Joe Rogan I would identify him as an independent. Uh, of course, Ron Paul, while he did run as a Republican, he is a devout libertarian to the core. And the thing is, what I find interesting about both Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Tulsi Gabbard is that they can attract not all of them but a small group of libertarians, Republicans, and conservative independents that would say, yeah, I like what Representative Tulsi Gabbard's talking about. She can earn, oh my God, my vote. Surprise, surprise. I mean, the DNC establishment, like Clinton or Biden would assume, well, you guys have to vote for us or else. You don't want Trump again. But Representative Tulsi Gabbard is out there talking to people and possibly, yes, earning their votes and changing their minds. This is something you're supposed to do in politics. It's 101, which is why the media, the establishment media, is doing a blackout on her and her entire, on their entire campaign. I, I think me. it's, uh, just to tack onto that, one of the primary uh, arguments that centrist or establishment Democrats will make is, well, we have to pivot to the center because we have to pull some Republican votes for a win. And here we have an example of someone who, because of a principled anti-war position, will will get major lefty progressive voters on their side, but will also get libertarian voters who are anti-war as well to uh, to vote for her or like her uh, for those reasons. Now, I don't always agree with how libertarians arrive at an anti-war position but they're at an anti-war position right. and to have a like really the only candidate that would do that that's a, that's a that's a huge that's that's a, a real feather in her cap and on top of that Joe Rogan is actually going to have Tulsi back on her show and again it's like Tulsi I'm really I'm, I'm really interested I, to see that I, I was very surprised that she was basically the only person I mean, Andrew Yang went on but it's, it's, I'm, it's kind of a separate thing, a little tangent, but it's related. I'm very interested to see in this election how many of the candidates will go on shows such as the Joe Rogan experience. Yeah, I know. And she she has a lot of strength for her campaign. Show. Or yeah. this show. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, maybe that. Hopefully she she will be interviewed well, by us. We're going to get her at some point. We are working I on it, I feel like once we hit 10K uh, subs, she's going to be like, oh, you guys seem like a good person to talk to. Yeah, mm -hmm. Chicago's <laughs> number one progressive independent media network.